we got to this we got to this scheme of key distribution via a key distribution center this third party so the goal is that we need to get a secret between shared between A and B and we need to share that secret securely so that no one can listen in and discover the secret because we're going to use that secret for encryption so we looked on Tuesday about okay if we want to distribute keys between every pair of users that may want to communicate there are many pairs we come up with this general formula of n times n minus 1 over 2 is the number of pairs so the more people the more pairs and it becomes too hard to distribute keys so we need to somehow automatically distribute keys and this scheme is one option that we assume first before any of this A and B have shared a master key with the KDC so there's a master key called KA uh, it's going to be used eventually KA so at the start of this scheme user A has KA KDC has KA so this is their master key and similar user B has KB and KDC also knows KB so they've shared master keys to get started how do they do that via what I call some manual mechanism which is uh, maybe they went to the KDC physically visited and they exchanged keys or maybe they sent it in a secure envelope or some some form which is via some trusted means of communications so we exchange master keys so if there are 100 users in our system there would be 100 master keys in total the KDC would know every master key and we call the KDC a trusted third party they're not involved in the communications between users but all users must trust it because they have all the master keys if you have the master keys you can do anything you like so once we've distributed the master keys then we follow these five steps which automatically distributes a session key so A wants to communicate with B to do so they both need to know some secret instead of using their masters we use a session key and in this scheme we call it KS so the aim is that both of them know KS the first three steps and th this can be implemented by software so they send some packets across a network KDC is a server uses A and B as some computers in the network so a wants to communicate to B so first what happens is that A sends a message to KDC saying I am user A my identity is A I want to communicate with B so the identity of B and some nonce value N1 think of some random value for the purpose of identifying that the response is going to relate to the the initial request so we can keep track of uh, that the next one message 2 is going to contain the same nonce value it's in here somewhere n1 so when a receives the second message it knows that this second message is a response to the first message like a sequence number so we can keep track so we send this to a with the meaning saying i want to communicate with b can you please generate a session key for me or for us so we send this message to KDC. KDC generates a session key, KS, creates some random key, KS, and then sends this response back. And if you look close, you can see there are two parts, two encrypted parts. The left side is encrypted with KA. The right side, so this concatenate, concatenation operator, is encrypted with KB. The idea is that the left side encrypted with KA is intended for user A and what it contains is the session key so when user A receives this and they decrypt they will learn the session key and it contains the the values that user A sent to the KDC just to confirm that this session key is for this request that you just made 
Okay? In case we make multiple requests over some period of time, we can keep track that this response is specifically for this request. So that first or that left part, when it's received by A, it was created by KDC. The only other person who can decrypt is the person that has KA, which is user A. Okay, so A decrypts. A learns a session key. The right part, the right hand side here, after this concatenation operator, is then forwarded on unchanged to B. And we see the right part in message 2 is the session key, the one that was generated by the KDC, and the identity of A, the node that initiated the communications, encrypted with KB. So A takes this last part and sends it on unchanged in message 3 to B. Anyone who intercepts this message to decrypt, they need KB. So if a malicious user intercepts message 3, they shouldn't be able to read the contents because they shouldn't have KB. If they did, we've got a, a bigger problem because KB should be a key known only by B and the KDC. A sends this on to B, B decrypts, now B knows KS. And we're finished. Finished in that both A and B know the session key. And that was our goal, to get a session key between A and B. The last two messages are just a, a means of authentication to confirm that none of these are replays. It's not a malicious user sending message 3, it's actually user A. The idea is that message 4 is B saying, did you really send that? And message 5 saying, yes, I did. That's the, the, the intention here. Because if B sends this message 4 to A, but A did not send message 3, maybe someone malicious me sent message 3, then when A receives message 4, it would not resp respond with 5. Or similar, if a malicious user sent message 3 and B responds to that malicious user, the malicious user will not be able to generate message 5 because to generate message 5 you need to know N2. And the only way to know N2 is to know KS. And we're assuming that KS has been encrypted with KB so no one else should know it. So these last two steps, in fact, the, the third one is part, partially used for authentication too, is to confirm that there's no one in here trying to make these messages up or trying to replay these messages after they've already been sent. So now A and B know KS, and a session key we use usually for a limited period of time. So. Let's say A wants to download a file from server B. So they want to download a file, so they go through these steps. They contact the KDC, they get a session key, and then to securely download the file, they use that session key. When the download's complete, maybe the session's complete, and maybe in five minutes' time when they want to download another file, they could go through this procedure again and generate a new session key. So the session key is used for a limited lifetime, to follow this principle, the fewer times you use a key, the less chance an attacker has of discovering that key. So that's a, a common principle that we use. Don't use a key too often. So change keys as often as possible. So I would never ask you to remember this exact scheme. Okay, so in, an, in the upcoming quiz or exam, I will not ask Okay, draw this picture, but if you look at past exams, you'll see questions like, here is this picture, and answer some questions about, well, what does this mean? What's the purpose of step two? Or what can an attacker do? Why can't an attacker see KS? So explain what's happening based upon this scheme, or similar schemes. The idea is that we can use this in a network. We have some server, 
let's say, inside SIT. All our computers want to communicate securely. All our uh, lecture room computers, office computers, we want secure communications between any pair. So we have some KDC server in the network. We've manually given master keys to all of the computers. So if there are 200 computers that we want to allow in our network, each of them are configured with their own master key, and the KDC knows that master key. So the KDC knows 200 master keys. Then when one computer, A, wants to talk to another computer, they follow these five steps. Obtain a session key, encrypt their data for that session, and then maybe five minutes later or one day later, they may repeat that procedure. So it can be automated inside the network. So it's especially used inside organization networks when encryption is, is needed uh, between computers inside the network. What's the problem with this scheme? You're an attacker. What, what's, what are you going to try and do? Attack the KDC. Okay. We said the KDC knows all master keys. It also generates the session keys, so it knows the session keys. So if someone can compromise the KDC, they can learn everything. So the security of the whole system depends upon the security of the KDC. So if it's a server in our network, and someone can get physical access to that server, then the system is not secure. So you need to protect the KDC both network-wise and physically. Compared to the previous scheme we went through, so we went through at first a distributed approach. This one looks simpler, only three messages. It is from that perspective. The problem with this one is that there's a large number of master keys needed. Every end system must exchange a master key with every other end system. And that leads to an exponential growth in, in master keys. The benefit of a de decentralized system, there's no trusted third party that we have to rely on. Okay, so we don't have to trust some other central server. So that's the benefit of this system. The disadvantage, too many keys with a large number of nodes. Now just go back to a few slides we, I think, this slide that we skipped over a little bit. So we've talked now about master and session keys. So it's common in many systems that we have a hierarchy of keys. We use master keys to exchange session keys. So we encrypt the session key with a master key. And then we use the session keys to exchange data. So we encrypt the data with session keys. With the idea that over time we can regularly change the session key and we're only using the master key very occasionally. That is whenever we generate a new session key. So this concept of change keys rapidly or uh, regularly and automatically. So often the master keys are manually exchanged. That is, I go to the computer and program in a master key. And, but they're not changed very often, seldomly. Whereas session keys, which are used much more than master keys, are automatically exchanged across the network because we can encrypt them with the master keys and change on a regular basis because we use them a lot. How long do we change keys? So what's the key lifetime? The shorter the lifetime, the better it is for security. Again, the, the fewer times you use a key, the less chance it is for the attacker to find the key. That's the concept. But if we change the key too often, every time we change key, we need to go through a few steps. So if we're using this scheme, every time we want to change a session key, we must send these five packets through the network. So we cannot do it too often, otherwise that overhead of communicating with will be too much. So we need a trade-off. 
In some cases, it depends upon the applications, the network applications being used. Say, if you're using a TCP application, you can do it on each connection or after every few minutes in some cases. So it depends upon the, the network usage. Change more often is better for security, but less convenient or more overhead. One more slide. You can extend this concept of a key distribution center of having multiple KDCs. So one KDC for our campus, another one for Rungsit campus, and then another cent uh, higher one up in the hierarchy that is used for distributing keys between those KDCs. So you can have a hierarchy of KDCs. And if one of them's compromised, that means the other ones are not necessarily compromised. And therefore, uh, we, we limit the, the impact of some security compromise. So this is two examples of how to exchange, if you see the, the heading here, symmetric keys using symmetric key cryptography. So again, the intention, get a secret, a shared secret key between A and B. How do we do it? We encrypted using symmetric key encryption. So that was one approach for key distribution. Any questions on the KDC? A key distribution center. Yep. Um, the format is known, so they know that first comes uh, the ID of identification of A and then B and they're complicated and they know that every ID has this and many, this and that many bits. Yeah. Yes, this is a, a protocol, so it would be agreed upon about the exact structure and, and the protocol, the exchange of messages, yes. So an attacker knows that they're going to do this. So you need to some, or you, what's, what can an attacker do given this knowledge? And the, the attacks generally uh, 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 related to, well, can they send a fake message and try and fool them? Or can they re replay messages which were sent in the past to try and cause some disruption? And the nonces help in those cases because if you can keep track of the messages that you've dealt with in the past, uh, like if you keep think of N1 as a sequence number, we can, if you receive a replay of this message, then you can discard it. Or if message three was replayed by a message uh, by a malicious user, then the fact that the malicious user wouldn't be able to send back four and five correctly would mean that it would be detected. So yes, everyone knows this scheme, the format of the messages, uh, but because we're encrypting with these master keys and doing this extra steps of checking, did you really send this? Uh, finding attacks is difficult. You see any? That's a common exam question. What can you do to break this scheme? A different nonce, that is, in which one? Yep. Yes. A malicious user could send this message, but then it would be encrypted with KA. So a malicious user receives a response, what do they gain? They cannot gain KS because it's encrypted with KA and KB. So they could receive a message, but you need to think, well, what do they gain from that? They shouldn't be able to, be able to gain KS because it's encrypted. It's encrypted here and here. IDs are known. IDs like uh, an address of a computer, an ID of a user. So IDs are generally known. Message 3 is encrypted with KB, so anyone, no one, no one but B should be able to read the contents of that. Even A cannot fake that because it's encrypted with KB. So even though A receives it, uh, they cannot see the contents. So they would not be able to change the identity, for example, because it's already encrypted in there.
Let's look at some other ways to distribute secrets. What about using public key cryptography? So I want to get a secret from me to someone else. We cannot send the secret across a network. We must encrypt it. So use public key cryptography to encrypt that secret and send it. So dis distributing symmetric keys, shared secret keys, using, here we, I said asymmetric encryption, which is, a is public key cryptography. Asymmetric is public key crypto. I should change the title. Then. Just another name. Remember, public key crypto. Let's have a test. Okay. Public key cryptography. If you encrypt a message with your public key, who can decrypt it? You encrypt a message with your public key, who can decrypt it? Hard one to start with. Everyone, everyone, anyone else? If you encrypt a message with your public key, who can decrypt it? Yourself only. Okay. If something's encrypted with a public key, the only way to decrypt it is using the corresponding private key. So if I encrypt something with a public key, my public key, the only way to decrypt is using my private key and no one else has my private key. So just remember the ordering or the, the fact that if you encrypt with one, you can only decrypt with the other. If you encrypt something with a private key, your private key, what's the purpose of that? Verify for a signature. If I encrypt something with my private key, who can decrypt? Everyone. Okay, because you need my public key to decrypt and everyone can have my public key. It's public. So what's the purpose of that? It's used for signing. Since it decrypts with my public key, it means it must have been encrypted with my private key. means it must have come from me because only I have my private key. What are another combination? If you want to send me a secure message, what do you do? A confidential message. Encrypt it with RSA and which key in RSA? You're correct. Which key in RSA? Public or private? You want to send to me a <coughs> confidential message. You encrypt using the destination, my public key. Okay. If you want to send a message to me, I'm the destination, you encrypt that message with my public key. How do you get it? Easy. It's public. You send it to me, the only person who can decrypt is me because only I have my private key. Okay, so that's the other uh, common scenario. What's the other, the fourth one? I think the fourth one, like the first, will not make sense or not be used. So encrypt with your own private key for signing encrypt with the other person's public key for confidentiality. That's how we use public key crypto. So, easy. Use it to distribute secret keys. I want to send a secret to you. I will encrypt with your public key. Send you the encrypted secret. You can, you can decrypt it. So we can use public key cryptography. Uh, Let's go through a few examples or a few different schemes for distributing secrets by using public key cryptography. Two now and, and we'll go back to another one elsewhere. Why don't we just use public key all the time? Because it's slow. So why, why do we want to distribute a secret key when we could just encrypt with my with the public key all the time because encrypting a large amount of data with public key cryptography is 
rel relatively slow compared to symmetric key cryptography. So in practice, we want to use symmetric keys. So a common use of public key cryptography, asymmetric encryption, is exchanging secrets. First approach. One way. We need to exchange a secret between A and B. So, easy approach. A sends a message to B saying, here's my public key. I'm user A. So, public key of A and identity of A. B chooses a secret key, generates KS, and encrypts it with the public key of A and sends that back encrypted to A. Because KS was encrypted with PUA, only A can decrypt because only A has the private key. So here's one way. Now both B, who generated KS, and A, who decrypts and finds KS, both of them know KS. That was our aim. Draw a picture that attacks that scheme. On this slide, on your blank slide, draw the, a man in the middle attack. Use your knowledge of what and the, the name suggests. Let's say there's a user C in the middle. What can they do to defeat this scheme? So the scheme is, I want to communicate to you, I send you my public key, you choose a secret and encrypt that secret with my public key and send it back to me. That's these two steps. Now. What if there was someone in the middle who could listen into the messages and modify messages? What can they do to defeat this scheme? Draw it. So to get started, draw A, B, A, C, B, where C is the man in the middle. Man or woman. Draw A, C and B. That won't help you. Helps to bring a piece of paper sometimes to lectures. Maybe a pencil or a pen. So draw and think, if A and B follow this procedure, what could you do as a malicious user in the middle to, to fool them? Good. Draw C in the middle of B and A to get started. So A and B don't know C is in the middle. Okay? They don't know. They st send these messages, uh, but that C is trying to do something to learn the key, learn KS. What can they do? Does B know anything about A? A and B are computers. So they don't know anything about each uh, What do you mean, know anything? Uh, try, see what happens. Try, draw it, mm -hmm. and come up with a scheme for doing it. Okay? Generate an attack. Yeah, you can do different things, but try and see if it's if it's successful. I want to see some pictures. Yeah. Sorry. Will B send back to C? Possibly. Yeah. The, the, purpose is, the purpose is that C would like to learn KS. And even better, learn KS and not let A and B know that they've learned KS. So, A and B follow this protocol. A sends this message. When B receives, it sends back a response. What happens?
And in this case, we have a man in the middle, C. So A sends a message. B is going to respond, but C can do something. They can intercept in the middle those messages and even create new messages. What can they do to learn KS? This is looking good. I think a few people have got the attack. Look, A follows the normal procedure of sending PUA, IDA, to get started. A wants to send a message to B, so they generate PUA, IDA. They send that. That's the normal procedure according to this protocol. But our man in the middle, C, intercepts. Before it gets to B, let's say A is a computer here, B is a server somewhere else. In between that path, C receives this message and changes it before they send it on to B. What do they change it to? Or what do they change? PUC. No. How do you learn someone's public key? Well, it's public. They can send it to you. That's what this scheme was. We'll come back to some other ways later, but we'll see this game doesn't work in, in some cases, and that's why the attack's successful. But this way of learning the public key, A sends the public key to B. C, the malicious user, changes it from PA to its own public key. PUC. Sorry, it changes PUA to PUC. What, what ID? ID A. Of course, you don't change that. So think the ID is someone's name or address, but we change the actual public key. How do we, So B receives this, gets a message. Here's a message from A and therefore it should contain the public key of A. But in fact it contains the public key of C. B doesn't know that because the public key is just a, a sequence of bits. How do you know whose it is based upon the identity? B generates KS. and sends back a reply. And according to our scheme, the reply that B sends is the KS that you just created encrypt with the public key that you just received. public key of C in this case. Okay, B doesn't know it's the public key of C. I've written it's the public key of C, but B doesn't know that. He just receives some public key. Whose is it? Well, based upon the identity, it's A's public key. We think it is. So we encrypt KS with it, send back that, Someone who intercepts this, another user who intercepts, cannot see it, but C intercepts on the way back to A, C intercepts this response 
And because it was encrypted with a public key of C, C can decrypt it. C decrypts. And when they decrypt, they learn KS. Because C has the private key of C, they learn KS. What's next? What does C send to A? What does C send to A? It would be nice to send to A because we'd like an attack where we learn from the malicious user, we learn the secret key and A and B think no one knows the secret key. So A and B keep communicating using that secret key. Otherwise, it's not going to be so useful to learn the secret key if they, the others can detect it. Give him whatever he wants is not enough because if we give them the wrong value, he will try and encrypt data and send a B and they'll quickly detect that they've got the wrong key. So, correct. Don't give him whatever he wants. Give him the encrypted session key. Not whatever he wants, what he wants. He may want something else. Okay, you're correct. Encrypt with a public key of A, KS. And when A decrypts, because A has the private key, A learns KS. So from A's perspective, they sent the first message. What do they receive back? The expected message, because it decrypts with the private key of A and they learn KS. So A knows the session key. From B's perspective, the other user, they receive the request public key and identity, they create a session key and they encrypt it and send it back. And they get no error messages later, so they know KS. But from our man in the middle, C, by doing these changes, changing the public key to its own, decrypting and learning KS, and then encrypting with PUA, which of, of course is public, C has learnt KS and A and B don't know that. A and B still think everything's okay. So now A encrypts their highly confidential data and sends it to B. Everything that's sent between A and B using KS can be decrypted by C. So our man in the middle can decrypt everything. So the scheme's not so good from that perspective. The attack is easy. In practice, this attack requires someone to be able to be in the middle and intercept and modify packets. Okay, so it requires them to be, if it's in a network, to be in, in the path between A and B and be able to intercept packets. If we have a communications link where they cannot do that, then our scheme here is okay. So it's only useful if the attacker cannot modify and insert messages. Some networks that's the case but in the, the public internet, you cannot assume that. So it's not secure in large network or in the public networks. How do you improve? This is another way. Well, how do we improve? Make sure we know the correct public key. And our, our next part of these slides will talk about how do we get public keys to the users? Because our problem here was that A sent its public key, but C changed it. So when B got the public key of A, it can't recognize that it's not the public key of A. It's the public key of C. That's the problem with public key cryptography. We need a way that we can distribute public keys such that the person who receives it is sure that it is that person's public key. So we'll look at detailed ways of doing that. 
Uh, before we go on to this other one, and actually we won't spend much time on it, the, the next topic is how to distribute public keys and we see that's a, a challenge in public key cryptography. So we'll spend some time on that. But let's go back. Back to public key cryptography lecture notes. I think you have it at the front of your handouts. Let's try another scheme. Close this one. Go back to the topic on public key cryptography where we talked about the principles. We went through RSA. Remember RSA? We take our message to the power of E mod N and decrypt, similar. There were some slides we skipped. One was called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. We're going to go through that now. Before we go through, a quick test. I'm going to give you some names of algorithms and you need to tell me what, whether it's symmetric key, public key, or something else. Everyone's ready? Okay, RSA. Symmetric key, public key, hash function, what is RSA? Which type of algorithm? Symmetric key or public key algorithm or hash algorithm or what else have we had? Random number generator. Which one? Public key, RSA, public key cryptography. All right. These are the things you need to remember even if you can't remember the actual algorithms. AES. AES. Symmetric key. Okay. DES. Symmetric key. Uh, MD5. Hash. Okay. Uh, have we got any others? Um, triple DES. Symmetric key. DES. Um, SHA. Hash. Secure so hash algorithm. So try and recognize at least when someone talks about RSA that we're talking about public key cryptography. And all right, AES, triple DES, in your, I think I gave you an assignment or a homework. What do you use? Different ciphers maybe. Uh, with OpenSSL we use, so you can use things like Camellia and many other ciphers. Diffie-Hellman, what is it? Diffie-Hellman. Symmetric, public, hash, public key cryptography. So we're going to go, go back and go through a public key cipher. But it's specifically for key exchange. RSA we could use for encrypting data. We don't use this Diffie-Hellman algorithm for encrypting data or signing. We use it for key exchange get a secret from A to B. Okay, so there are different public key algorithms but they have different purposes. Let's go Diffie, through Diffie-Hellman key exchange and Diff, Diffie and Hellman, the two people, are the two people who created public key cryptography or first published about public key cryptography. So back in 1976, they proposed public key crypto systems. And their algorithm, or the one we'll go through, is an ex algorithm for exchanging a secret key. Same as before, we want to get a secret from A to B without anyone else knowing that secret. So just for exchanging a key. It's based upon discrete logarithms, the mathematical problem that makes it uh, a public key algorithm is discrete logarithms. And if we remember back to RSA, calculating exponentials modulo some number, especially a prime, is relatively easy. That is, 
a large number raised to the power of some other large number mod some prime, we can calculate in a short amount of time. But doing the inverse of an exponential, a logarithm, is extremely hard. And a logarithm in mod modulo arithmetic is called a discrete logarithm. So we'll see how that is used in Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Here's the algorithm. Uh, we'll go through it by using an example with some small values. To get started, we have some parameters which we call a public. Globally public means everyone can know these values. Q and alpha in this algorithm description. Let's choose some numbers. Q is a prime number and alpha normally is a, a primitive root of Q. We mentioned primitive roots when we looked at RSA. We'll not go back and explain them, but accept that alpha is a primitive root of Q. I'll give you the values for our example. So we have A and B. They want to get a shared secret, KS, or some secret value between them that no one else knows. They st start with some public values, Q, and let's choose a value, a prime number. For our simple calculations, I'll use a small number, uh, and alpha, a primitive root of Q, and 3 is an OK value. And they're public values. Everyone knows them, including B, and later including an attacker, Alpha, not A. So they're known up front. Q should be a large prime number, not 353. It should be much larger. But for, for our calculations, let's use a small prime number. So, the steps. User A selects some private value we'll call XA. Should be less than Q. So that's the condition. Choose some random value less than Q. And then user A will calculate a public value we'll call YA based upon this algorithm. Alpha to the power of XA mod Q. So let's do that for user A. Choose XA. So select some XA, and I will select as user A, because I've got the numbers, 97. Just a random number, less than 353. Fine. And now calculate YA as, what, alpha to the power of XA mod Q. In our case, alpha is 3. XA, we just chose to be 97. Mod the known Q353. We'll go through the steps and then analyze it later. Which is? Anyone with a calculator? Calculator, anyone? See if your phone will calculate. Okay. 3 to the power of 97 mod 353. 3 to the power of 97. 3 to the power of 97 mod 353 is 40. Okay. So you need a calculator for that one.
But even with large numbers, when we deal in practice with very large numbers, computers can calculate that in reasonable time. So x, xa will be a private value. Don't tell anyone xa. We need to keep it secret. ya is a public value. And what we do is we send ya to b. So let's send it. So we send a message from A to B where we say, okay, Y A that I've chosen is 40. In fact, at this point, we could also send alpha and Q if B didn't know them. Because again, they can be public. Anyone can know the values. Alpha is 3, Q 353. Three. Sometimes B will know in advance, otherwise we can send in a message saying, here are the values that you should use. B receives. Now B follows the same steps. It chooses some X and calculates some Y using the same steps, but of course will choose a different X most likely. They choose a random X less than 353. B, let's say, chooses XB equal to some random number of 233 and calculates YB. I'm using lowercase. Same, same way. Alpha to the power of XB mod Q. Same alpha, 3, XB, 233, the chosen value, mod 353. So they follow the same steps, except they'll choose different x's. Assuming q is large enough, they choose a random x, they'll choose different values. Alpha to the, mod, the power of xa mod q, alpha to the power of xb mod q. Answer, calculator time. Three to the power of 233 mod the same 353, 248. And now B sends that value back to A. Actually, before we can send it and then calculate, but B will send the message back and then B calculates a new value. So we've just gone through, we started with two public values, Q and alpha. X generates a key. Sorry, A generates a key, selects X, calculates Y. B follows the same algorithm, selects X, calculates Y. They exchange their Y values. And then they both go through this calculation to calculate this K. The Y you received to the power of the X you chose mod Q. Let's try. We'll do it from B's perspective first. Done that right. Let me just check. Okay. 
we're going to do this step of we've done B generated YB they're going to send that back and then B this last step K equals YA to the power of XB mod Q K equals YA to the power of XB mod Q YA we received YA is 40 XB we chose as 233 mod the same Q 353 calculator will tell us the answer forty to the power of two three three mod three five three anyone want to guess it's less than three hundred and fifty three one hundred and sixty Let's record that one. So user B has calculated K to be 160 and we send back our Y. So YB we calculated to be 248 now user A follows the same steps to calculate so this was our K I'll call it KB subscript KB K subscript A same algorithm but using the opposite values that is user B cho used A's value of Y B's value of X mod Q and they got 160 A's value of Y came from the message that A sent it B sends back his value of Y 248 and user A calculates using YB <coughs> to the power of the original XA they chose what do we choose it's there somewhere mod our Q 97 we chose so let's calculate that 248 the power of 97 mod 353 calculator time any guesses Maybe guess. 160? 260. Let's try. 248 to the power of 97 mod 353. 248 to the power of 97 mod 353. 160. Is that luck? will show that it's not luck that's the design of the algorithm they'll always get the same number here and that's our secret the idea was that A and B share a secret some number that they both know that no one else knows and following this at these steps in this case they both end up with two with a value on either side 160 160 the same value so now we need to check why did they get the same value 
and more importantly, what can an attacker do to try and find that value? So just go back to the top. A and B, they both know Q and alpha. That's public. Everyone knows. A selects a value of X, calculates Y, sends their value of Y, and in this case alpha and Q, to user B. User B chooses an X, some independent value, calculates his value of Y, and sends that back to A. And in the meantime, B calculates his value of K, 160, and when YB is received by user A, they calculate their value of K, and they'll get the same value. Why do they get the same value? Let's quickly look at that. We'll see the mathematics is quite simple of uh, exponentials. What steps did we go through, for example? What did user A do? Their first calculation was YA is alpha XA mod Q. Whereas B's calculation was YB alpha to the XB mod Q. And then A's calculation, when they received YB, they calculated what? K, I have to remember, K to the power of YB, a K, y, K equals YB to the power of XA mod Q. So that are the steps that A chose. Chose at X, calculate Y, they received YB, and then calculated K. Let's call it actually to be precise K subscript A. Let's substitute in, no, let's do what? Let's substitute this YB into this calculation for KA. That is, I'm going to replace YB with alpha to the XB mod Q. What is YB? YB is alpha to the XB mod Q. That's from the right hand side. That's this part. All of it to the power of XA mod Q. When we simplify, what do we get? If we go back to our early modular arithmetic and some of the properties, the same properties that hold with our normal arithmetic for uh, exponentials. We can actually, when we take some number mod Q and then mod Q again, then it's the same as just mod Qing once. Okay, think of this concept of. Uh, 13 mod 10 is 3, mod 10 again is 3, mod 10 again is 3. If we keep modding by 10, we still end up with 3. So in fact, you only need to mod by Q once. So we'll remove this mod Q. It's the same as alpha to the XB, all to the power of XA, mod Q. And alpha to the XB all to the power of XA is the same as alpha to the XB times XA.
that's our normal properties of exponentials. 2 to the power of 3 all to the power of 4 is 2 to the power of 3 times 4 or 2 to the power of 12. So this is Ka from A's perspective. Now do the same for B. Will we have space? Yes, we'll find some space. KB is YA to the XB mod Q. This is from the, the algorithm description. And now let's substitute this YA into here. So replace YA with alpha to the XA mod Q. So KB would be alpha to the XA mod Q. So this YA was replaced by this value all to the power of XB mod Q. The same simplifications apply. We can remove this mod Q. And we get alpha to the XA all to the power of XB mod Q. And again, that becomes alpha to the XA times XB. Mod Q. A, <coughs> A calculates KA to be alpha to the XB times XA mod Q. B calculates KB to be alpha to the XA times XB mod Q. They are the same. Okay. So this is just the proof that if we follow this algorithm, A and B will end up with the same value of K. And we'll use this K as our shared secret, a value that both A and B know. Okay. So this is the proof that we get the same value at the end. That's the easy part. Why is it secure? So now put on your black hat and <coughs> what can an, a, a malicious user do to find that value of K? From this information, what a malicious user can do to find 160? If they can, this is not secure. If they can't, then this is a secure key exchange. Think, what can the user, a malicious user do? Look at our exchange of messages and what the malicious user knows. Okay, yeah. in our exchange, let's look at what the malicious user knows. So, go back to our start. Alpha and Q are known. They are public values, so they are known by the malicious user. Those values are known. So we'll list them in a moment. XA was chosen by A and is kept private. So the malicious user does not know XA. YA was calculated and sent across the network. So assuming the malicious user can intercept, they can learn YA. So YA is known or public. YA, Alpha and Q. XB is secret. It's only known by user B. But YB 
which is sent back will also be known. So YB can be discovered by the attacker. So given those values, what can the attacker do? Let's try. Known values. What have we got? Q is 353. Alpha is 3, YA was 40, YB 248, and they know the algorithm. So they know all the steps, all the equations which were used. So this is the attacker. What do you try and find? You want to find K. What steps do you take to find K, the secret? Just use this formula. Try it. So find a f write down a formula from that, the description of the algorithm that you would use to find K. Or something on the way to K. Eventually, we'll need to do a discrete logarithm. We know that Ka was calculated, for example, as Yb to the Xa mod Q. So the attacker knows this. And we know YB is 248. XA we don't know. We know Q. So now, for the attacker to calculate the secret K, they need to know XA. First approach, what's the brute force approach? Try every value of XA. How many values are there in this example? How many possible values? XA was chosen to be less than 353, so there are 353 possible values. So here, if we know XA, we'll get K. So you could try all possible values. 0, 1, 2, 3, up to... 352, because it was less than. Okay, so that's one approach. How do we stop that attack? Make sure, instead of using 353, use a very large prime number. Therefore, trying a brute force in that case would take forever. So, to stop such an attack of trying all the XAs, just make sure the prime is large enough. 353 is not large enough, but when you've got hundreds of bits, uh, you can make it large enough. So how else can we find XA if we can't do a brute force? Look at the algorithm. Where's XA used? Maybe this algorithm here, or this equation. YA equals alpha to the XA mod Q. That's also known by the attacker. YA is known, it's 40. Alpha is known, it's 3. XA is unknown. Q is known. Our aim, find XA. If we find XA, we can calculate K and we've got the secret. Here we have an equation. Three known variables, one unknown. Should be easy. What's the 
How do we find XA? Inverse. What's the name of the operation? It's a logarithm. Remember, we've got an exponential here. We want to find the index. So, given an exponential, find the index. It's a logarithm. The discrete log, so xa equals the discrete log, d log, all right, in base 3 mod 353 of 40. That is, if what number do we raise 3 to, what power do we raise 3 to, and mod by 353 to get 40? So a logarithm, but with modular arithmetic. So if we can solve this, we find xa. Once we know xa, we can calculate k, and we've got the secret. And if we remember back to the public key cryptography, we said discrete logarithms are one of those problems, if the numbers are too large, are large enough, we cannot solve it. Okay? So if Q is a large prime, and therefore these numbers will be large, solving a discrete logarithm takes too much time. So that's where the security of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange comes in. With large enough numbers, just solving a discrete log takes forever. And you can look at other ways that the attacker can try and find k, and you'll see that it comes back to solving a discrete logarithm, or brute force. And the way to make them impossible, make the numbers large enough. You can try from B's perspective, try and find XB, and you find it's the same problem. It all comes back to a discrete logarithm. As a result, this key exchange algorithm is considered secure. That is, if you use large enough parameters, then if you exchange the keys in this way, both A and B will know the secret K, the same secret K they'll have at the end, and even if someone intercepts all the messages, they cannot learn that value of k. So we exchange the secret, and no one else knows the secret. That's the goal. So Diffie-Hellman is commonly used for, for key exchange. Many practical protocols secure, secure shell when you SSH into, an into a server uses Diffie-Hellman for key exchange on a regular basis. That just shows what we tried to draw and the steps that were calculated. So we've gone through an example. It's insecure against a man in the middle attack. Okay, it's still possible that someone in the middle, if they can be in the middle, can do an attack on the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So for it to be used, you need some other way to ensure the person you're talking with, with is the, who you think they are. And next week, we'll move into the topic of how do we make sure the public key that we get is real. So we've seen a man in the middle attack where we got a public key at B. We thought it was A's, but it was C's. So then the question is, how can I make sure if I have a public key, it is of that person? It's not someone else's. And that will lead us to public key certificates. So we'll look at that next week. And we'll see certificates are used in secure web browsing. So we'll lead to that. Any questions on Diffie-Hellman in the last couple of minutes? Diffie-Hellman, RSA, they look simple. The mathematics is not too hard. But they're very, uh, very useful for, and used very commonly for exchanging keys, uh, signing things. Everyone's okay? Those people that did the quiz last week, you can come and collect your quiz. Uh, you should see your scores online if you like. Next week we'll continue with 